one of the hallmarks of aging and th that you've looked at in particular is proteostasis, right. right? So the stability of proteins within the cells. So pr proteostasis is quite complicated, I believe. So c could you kind of condense what is proteostasis? So I guess yeah, what is proteostasis stasis, and how does it change with age? How does it go right. wrong? So proteostasis per se as a term, basically it's a term that encompasses uh, the wall uh, balance of the of the proteome, meaning mm. the proteome is maintained in check, let's say in our bodies, in our cells, by essentially, I would say, three main pathways, which is protein synthesis, protein folding, and protein degradation. So these together, when they are in check, and you get, let's say, normally folded and functional proteins, it's what we call proteostasis, which means essentially protein homeostasis, mm. right? Now, the thing is, these three steps are all very complex. They all require several uh, other protein effectors or processes, and they are sensitive to uh, external or internal stressors or stimuli. For instance, for protein, f uh, for protein synthesis, you know, you need, of course, uh, signals that promote, you know, um, translational proteins. And uh, this can be affected essentially by nutrient sensing, aging, and the quality and the assembly of the ribosomes and so forth. Then you have protein folding, which is put in place by chaperons. Uh, these are other proteins that help proteins essentially to find their conformation. And these are there are several classes of chaperons depending on the type of proteins that need to be folded in which structure. And this can be also an energy dependent uh, process sometimes. And then uh, for proteins that are normally misfolded and that cannot be uh, essentially put in the right position or in the right conformation, then there is usually uh, they cannot. Th there is two fates, right? Either they accumulate and then they could be start becoming detrimental, or they get, can get be degraded. So the cells mm -hmm. can get rid of them by degradation processes, and this could be uh, macroautophagy, chaperon mediated autophagy, or let's say ubiquitin mediated proteasomal or lysosomal degradation. So there are several steps in all this, and that's why proteostasis is very complex. And with what happens is that because these are energy regulated processes and sensitive also to ex metabolic or external insults or, or stimulations with the aging process or with age associated processes some of these or different aspects of the proteostasis as, uh, process also become the, uh, altered so for instance you may get uh, with aging you know you get less energy because you know also mitochondria producing less ATP and less um, uh, let's say more oxidative stress so proteins get damaged and therefore they need to be de degraded, otherwise they start accumulating in terms of informal damaged proteins, which are not functional anymore. But if you have also less energy and the degradation processes like autophagy or the proteasome require energy to function, they may not take place correctly. And that's where you start getting this, let's say, off course of proteins that start aggregating and then they become essentially detrimental. And that's mm -hmm. where problems start occurring with things like neurodegeneration or um, uh, muscle inclusion, um, uh, inclusion body myositis and so forth. So all these proteins characterized by increased protein aggregation. Right. So if you have, if you, you talk about neurodegenerations, you have Alzheimer's, right? So right. Alzheimer's famously has the, the buildup of these amyloid beta, uh, which are misfolded proteins, essentially. Right. But do you see it Elsewhere, so Alzheimer's is just kind of a, a special case, but we also see it in muscles and in other cells, and it it's a matter of whether it becomes pathological or not. Right. So yeah. So certainly, I mean, Alzheimer or other neurodegeneration mm -hmm. diseases linked to protein aggregation, they are characterized clearly by this uh, collapse of proteostasis. In particular, in some cases of Alzheimer's, especially not, not all forms of dementia actually are characterized by plaques, mm. by accumulation of this um, uh, plaque burden. But if we are thinking about uh, uh, Alzheimer's disease in particular, some of the, of the cases are characterized by this buildup of fibrillary amyloid beta plaques. And these are essentially things that are in the fibrillary state, which means it's the latest stage of protein aggregation, of amyloid aggregation. And these are usually kind of accumulating outside so the cells uh, try to kind of prevent that the buildup occurs only within the cells because that's where it becomes really cytotoxic mm. and so you get these plaques that are forming and accumulating outside of the cells of the neurons at least so what happens is that's the characterization or a normal mark, I would say of narrow degeneration and people have tried and they're trying I mean major corporates are still trying with the, uh, reducing the buildup of these plaques by yeah. using antibody therapies and so forth the issue is that 
what is becoming more and more evident is that the damage within the neurons or within the, the brain cells has already occurred when also there is this formation of the plaques. And by reducing the plaques doesn't seem to be the, the only solution or the best solution to actually uh, get back you know, the cognitive function and repair essentially the damaged neurons. And my studies, and that's why I got interested in this protein aggregation and the link with the longevity and aging, we observed them already in the context of healthy aging and in the context of Alzheimer, but we focused on the uh, intracellular protein mm -hmm. aggregates rather than on the plaques that you observe in the right. brains. Because cells start accumulating these uh, damaged proteins within the cells first in forms of oligomeric aggregates, which then acts as seeds to build these fibrillary structures, which then are essentially uh, put outside of the cells. So what we understood uh, with my work when I was in uh, at EPFL and then also with other colleagues have, um, uh, from other labs have sort of gone in the same direction is that, for instance, it could either if it's a beta or if it's tau in the case of tauopathies, like also still in the case of Alzheimer or any other protein aggregation, if they start forming these amyloid uh, aggregates, they become cytotoxic first within the cells and the cells need to get rid somehow of this or prevent that they accumulate within the cells. And when we started using things like NAD boosters or play with mitochondrial function, so to make cells resilient to stressors, they would actually start reducing the formation of these aggregates. And therefore, you know, by reducing the internal buildup of these aggregates, you also don't get the, you also reduce the external accumulation. And in this case, we saw that the cells were, the neurons were doing much better. The mice, when we did this in mice, there were, the cognition was coming back. And there is parallel studies at the, pre at the preclinical level from my ex, from my work, from my ex lab, but also from other labs showing that ad additional interventions that could target for instance, metabolism like mitochondria or using NAD boosters or mitophagy boosters and so on, they may actually counteract this accumulation of intracellular aggregates before they become patholog pathological. And that's the thing where we have hope to maybe kind of anticipate a bit and ameliorate uh, the, uh, the disease conditions. Yeah. Okay. So a couple of questions I yeah. had, had while we go. So the, the protein aggregate begins inside the cell yeah. and then it gets exported. Is yeah. that right? So there's some way, it, because it, an aggregate could be, oh, I yeah. suppose it's just a single protein and then it gets. So it, it depends really on the type of protein. So in the context of aging, actually, this is still a lot of work to be done. So mm -hmm. we, we have observed accumulation of these amyloid intracellular oligomeric structures within muscle and brain cells, but we actually haven't characterized yet which proteins are are this made of so this we actually really need to figure out uh, in the context of healthy um, healthy longevity at least or healthy aging in the context of alzheimer for instance if you're talking a beta yes i mean you have the app protein which gets cleaved um, and then it generates these ie beta fragments and there are several type of beta fragments which depending on let's say when essentially you're at risk of disease or you have genetic mutations in uh, in uh, these cases they start being cleaved off in uh, ways that become more pro aggregation prone and essentially you get two two things happening you get starting uh, this formation of these oligomeric ab beta structures within the cytos or within the cells and you get also an export of these a beta fragments outside of the cells which in time lead to also to the build up of the plaques outside of the cells however for us what looked very promising is the fact that when we were using our metabolic interventions we would observe a reduction of the intracellular aggregates mm. and you know in in conditions where you know like in a cell culture and so on where you don't need necessarily the you don't get to build the plaques outside of the cells right so in that sense that was already beneficial and that's what we think is happening also when we do this in vivo with the more complex models right and uh, yeah so the same way so NAD boosters, so raising NAD, I mean, in any way, right, seems to help with this. Right. Do, do you know anything about the mechanism? Why does having more NAD help reduce the protein buildup? So, yeah, so what we know from my studies, it's for sure there is a com an involvement of the mitochondrial homeostasis. So historically, NAD boosters and NAD increase have been linked to increasing either mitochondrial biogenesis or mitophagy. So getting essentially rid of bad mitochondria to make space for new, uh, more functional mm -hmm. mitochondria and therefore better uh, cellular energetics, bioenergetics. And again, as I mentioned, most of these 
proteostasis pathways, they require energy in order to function. Right. So what we have done in our studies, we supplemented, for instance, NAD precursors in simple models like cellular models or nematode models. And then in these models, you can very easily uh, do epistasis studies where you knock out a gene of interest and then you mm -hmm. see whether you lose the effect of the, let's say, NAD booster in this case. So what we saw is that, for instance, if you would knock down genes that are important for mitophagy, so for the removal of damaged mitochondria, or uh, that would uh, impair the mitochondria stress response adaptation. Uh, so the inability, they would promote the inability of mitochondria to cope with stress during aging or disease. Then the protein aggregation would not be cleared, would not be reduced anymore. Right. Meaning that there is an intermediate requirement of the mitochondrial homeostasis as well. How exactly this occurs, whether it's the mitochondria that generate energy for the like mm -hmm. ATP, for instance, for the proteostatic processes, or because they are generating less oxidative stress and therefore less damaged proteins, oxidative uh, status of the proteins, or whether there is some other involvement of the mitochondria, even directly participating in uh, uh, clearing the protein aggregates, because people also have shown that certain protein aggregates can even be taken up by the mitochondria and that helps to, to get rid of these uh, damaging proteins. So there are several pathways that need to be taken in, under observation for mechanistic studies.